Hello, everybody. Welcome to GC2. Hi. Glad to see everybody, some people. Um, I'm so glad to be here today. I was having a little bit of a rough weekend, and um, being here and practicing before church was really uh, life-giving for me. Uh, but uh, if you guys, um, so I hope that you guys are happy to be here too, and that God will um, use this time to bless you guys. Uh, if you guys want to stand with me, we're going to be reading today from Psalm 73, verses 25 to 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my, f my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. This is not reality for me, but that is what I would like in my heart. Willingness, right? The heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, um, yeah. So this is my prayer today for myself. You guys can pray that for yourselves as well. Um, all right, let's worship God together. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 
throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, the great high priest whose name is love, whoever to take communion. If you don't have a communion cup, please raise your hand and we'll make sure you have one. Well, as we prepare for communion in a moment, I want to share a few words in light of going through the gospel of Mark over these last months. We've seen so much from Mark's gospel. We've seen Jesus teach about the kingdom. We've seen healings and miracles. We've seen controversy with religious leaders. But, you know, there's one thing we haven't seen yet in the gospel of Mark. We haven't seen yet Mark telling us about an individual that Jesus loved personally. Until today, we'll see this in Mark. The passage we're going to encounter today is about a man, and it says that Jesus, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. Now, I don't want to spoil the sermon. We'll learn more about this encounter. But for now, as we prepare for communion, I want you to put yourself in the place of that one person, that individual that Jesus looks upon. And you see, this looking that Jesus does, it's a beholding. It's not like when we look at a clock and kind of ready to go for lunch or looking at the red light, you know, waiting for it to turn to green. Uh, this looking that Jesus does, it's when he fixes his eyes upon someone and he looks intently. It's looking at a person to know what's in the person, 
When Jesus looks, it's to know with this introspection, to know the heart of a person. And I think if we're honest, when we look at ourselves in this way, we look in our hearts and we see shortcomings, right? We see failures, we see guilt and shame, we see our misdirected, misdirected motives and affections, we see pride and envy, we can look inside and see faithlessness. We can see prayerlessness. I think when we look inside and we see these things, it causes us to hide from God. But the good news, church, is that Jesus doesn't look upon us as we look upon ourselves. When Jesus looks and sees, he still loves. And today we're going to see Jesus look upon this man and see everything about him, yet he had a deep love for him. And I want you to think about this extravagant, undeserving, unwavering love of God in Christ that welcomes us, that invites us to come to the communion table today. And if you think about why we should not hide from God, it's that God proves his love, Paul says. God demonstrates his love, Romans 5. God proves his own love for us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's this extravagant love of the Father that he extends to all sinners. And it doesn't change, church, on what he sees in us. And that's the good news, is that because of what he sees in us, God compels his love to be extended to us in Christ. Romans says, while we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. And so when we partake of communion, we are remembering that what we have received by faith in Christ, when we trust in the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross, what happens to us, Paul says in Romans, much more than since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. Isn't that wonderful news? Declared righteous. God is the righteous judge, and when he declares anyone who believes in Christ, sinful as he or she may be, God views that person as being righteous. For those who are in Christ, God overlooks our offenses. He doesn't see our badness because he sees Christ's righteousness in us. Paul says we are saved from the wrath of God. That is, without salvation, church, that person stands condemned. And that person is in danger of the wrath of God, the judgment of God, eternal separation from God. But because of the work of Christ, which we're going to remember in a moment, we are rescued and redeemed and reconciled to God. Amen? And communion is what we remember together as a church, what God in Christ has accomplished for us and what God in Christ has made available to us. Mark would tell us, if you have the communion cup, Mark tells us, as they were eating, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. You can open up the top and let's take the bread together. The body of Christ broken for you. Mark tells us, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and so they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many. Church, let's take the cup together. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. And as we ponder the great love of God that we will never exhaust, we thank you for your forgiveness. And when you look into our lives, what you see, Lord, the love of God is compelled and moves towards us and we see that in the cross we thank you Lord for all that you have accomplished for us and all the gifts that you bestow upon us we take the bread and the cup 
with great joy and thankfulness. And we await the day when we will see you again. Amen. Let's continue in worship.
Worship team, please join me in prayer. Our Father, all blessing and honor and glory and power be unto you who sit on the throne and unto the Lamb, our Lord and Jesus Christ, forever and ever. For you are worthy of all our praise and there is no one higher than you. You are merciful, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Your word says that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love to those who fear you. Father, we pray that we will be a congregation that fears you, that we will be in awe of your majesty, your glory, your splendor. May we also understand that we are unwell, unworthy in comparison to you. May we understand that despite this, that you love us dearly. May we understand the breadth and the height and the width of your love. As this last song that we sang, it says that as far as heights reach from the depths, as far as east is from the west. So far you have carried me. If ever I should lose my way, if ever I deny your grace, remind me of the price you paid. Now, Father, we pray that you remind us when we lose our way of how much you love us, that of the sacrifice Jesus made for us, that you love us dearly. May we, with humble and grateful heart, love you and gratitude love you with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. May we reflect the love that you have toward us, to our neighbors, and love them as ourselves. And may we obey your great commission of going out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Father, we pray for those in our church that, has, that have illnesses. Um, we pray for Gloria, who has high blood pressure and also has pulsations in her ear. We pray that she will be able to see a doctor soon, that you will um, heal her of this, that you will be able, when she sees a physician, be able to do the studies, get the studies done to find out what's going on and move on to the treatment plan. We pray for Ramona, who also has been dealing with a chronic neurologic problem, Father. We pray that you will be with um, Ramona and Gloria, that you will decrease their anxiety and their stress about what's happening with their bodies, Father, that uh, you will comfort them and give them peace. We also pray for Steve, who is dealing with a back issue as he's making plans for surgery. We thank you and give you praises for the successful surgery that Wayne has had. We pray for those in our congregation who's taking care of their parents who are ill, such as John and Amy, um, Julia, and also uh, past uh, Luke and Ruth. Father, we pray for the rest of the service. We pray that you will empower Pastor Jason with your spirit as he gives the word. Prepare our hearts to receive the word and we pray that you will transform our hearts and mind into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Good afternoon, GC2. Welcome. For those of you that are new, um, just want to welcome you especially. GC2, um, it's our hope and prayer that we would live out the Great Commission or Great Commandment in the Spirit of the Great Commission, and that's what GC2 stands for. It's our mission to glorify God by loving Him, loving people, and making disciples both locally and globally. Um, one amazing thing that I love about GC2 is just the heart of prayer. 
So before church in the cafe that's right through those doors, at 4 o'clock we have a group that meets to pray over the church, over each other. You're welcome to come and join us in prayer, silently or out loud, however God leads you, however you're comfortable. Everybody is welcome. And also on Zoom, on Thursday nights at 7.30, um, we have another group that meets um, just to pray, to pray for each other, to pray for the church, to pray for the nations, whatever God places on your heart. And again, everybody's welcome anytime you're able to. Um, we have a few fun things coming up for the women. Uh, we have a game night on the 24th um, at Ada's house, and you can bring a dessert to share. Last time I was there, there was whole tons of dessert. <laughs> so if you don't have time, you're still covered. Um, come and just play games and have fun. And then in March, we have a flower bar. And actually, as Casey introduced it last week, I was just waiting to find out, like, what is this? And it sounds incredible. You're going to have the chance to make bouquets of flowers and arrange. Kathy is actually really gifted in this, and so she's going to help lead the women. Um, and they'll have a light breakfast as well. And the kids at GC2, um, just a reminder to the parents to pick up our kids at the playground that's over here by the pickleball courts right after church, and then continue to mingle so they're not left there. It's kind of dark, if you haven't noticed, so it's great to go ahead and grab them. Um, and before the kids leave, I would just love to, let's pray. Let's pray for our kids. Father God, we thank you for the kids of GC2, Lord. We thank you for those that have just committed so much time and investment to lead them and to help them to grow, Lord. And we just pray that today, Lord, that they would just come to know you more, that you would give them a greater hunger and desire for you, Lord, that they would grow their love for you, Lord, and grow in their understanding of the depth of your love for them, Lord. We just ask that you would be with the kids and the youth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you're dismissed, and you guys can say hi to someone around you. Hey everyone, why don't you go ahead and find your seats? Um, for those of you who are new, I'm Jason and I'm just thrilled you're here, either in person or online. Uh, I just realized it's been six months since I've started and uh, I thought it'd be great. Well, I'm just saying that because I thought it'd be a good time to pull Luke out of retirement and next uh, Sunday he's going to preach for us, so we just get to have him sharing uh, his heart with us as he's just been, uh, what God's been doing in his life, kind of finishing up a little bit in Mark here. So uh, with that said, I'm going to ask Jess to come up. We um, want to just highlight a little bit about our discipleship groups, so you want to grab the mic and so I um, <laughs> thank you for leading us in worship. So we have some uh, groups happening, small groups, but specifically some discipleship groups. So Jess has a group that she's been uh, leading, and I thought it'd be great to just share a little bit about what your group's like, and if there's some ladies out here that are interested, um, perhaps this group may work. But just tell us a little bit about, like, how long has this, been, this group's been meeting? Yeah, um, our group has been meeting for, shoot, maybe a year or two. Okay. Um, we were we were in a Bible study, a co-ed Bible study before, and then um, our group split into men's and women's uh, w uh, men and women's D group, and so um, and it moved so that 
It's really cool. Casey and I can both have dgroup on the same night so that it takes up only one night a week yeah, and we're not great. away from our families that much. So it's okay. pretty cool. Great. What are some things that you've uh, learned from being in a discipleship group or things that really have how God's been using that in your own formation? Um, I, for our D group, we get really into the nitty gritty of things and we have very passionate discussions about theological topics. And it's really, really cool to see everybody's perspective and to kind of hash it out and still at the end of the day, have relationships with each other. <laughs> Great. Okay. Awesome. And uh, D groups, about three to five people. So that's kind of the ideal size. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And we have small groups as well on the website. There's more information on that. But we also have a couple groups. Steve's group's been meeting Sundays right before church. There's kind of a new curriculum that Steve's going to be using. So that's kicking off. Um, we have Michael Hughes who prayed for us uh, today. He's starting a Wednesday morning group as well. Where's Michael? You want to raise your hand? So that's if you're interested, you can uh, reach out to him. But we're just excited about 2024 kicking off uh, this new year with spiritual growth in small groups and D groups. So thank you, Jess. Is there anything else you want to add about your group? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so last year we had um, two of our ladies move away. And so we are... Um, we would love to have a couple of more ladies join our group. Um, and also, um, there, if anybody is interested in leading their own D group, you can talk to me or yeah. Jason or um, who's the head of that? Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's yeah. yeah. So. And we can equip yeah. you to start your own group. Yeah. All right. Uh, my group in particular, we are less of a Bible study and more of like a Christian book club. Um, the current book that we're going over is Mama Bear Apologetics, and it's really cool. It talks about different worldviews, and we um, go over, there's a, in the book, it's called like a chew and a spit method. So it takes the worldviews, and we process what is good about the worldviews, and then we compare it to what the Bible says, and we keep the good, and we spit out the bad. Um, yeah, and so that's what we're doing right now. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jess. All right. Well, let's, um, thank you again. Let's jump into the Word of God. Would you stand with me as we tune our hearts to the Scriptures, singing one of my favorites, Second Timothy chapter 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we've been doing over these past weeks through the gospel of Mark. We've been rightly dividing, looking at what God would have verse by verse, going through chapter by chapter of the Gospel of Mark. One more time. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, Hebrews would say. And we pray, Lord, to, right now that we would come under the authority and the guidance of the Holy Spirit you would speak to each person. Lord, you would impart a word, application, revelation. Lord, we thank you for the churches in this area. We pray for gospel partnerships here in Poway and beyond, North County, South, Lord, that the word would go forth and we'd see lives being changed. We believe, Lord, that you want to bring about revival in our own lives in this city and beyond. Give us eyes to see what you're doing. Give us boldness, Lord, to share your word with people who are in need. And now, Lord, we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Open up to the Gospel of Mark. 
We've made it to the midway point of chapter 10. I've titled this, Money and Possessions in the Kingdom. And I thought I'd just begin with a very shocking statistics. One UCLA researcher, uh, she says this, contemporary American U.S. households have more possessions per household than any society in global history. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Staggering fact when you think about, she's talking about global history. And I think we all would agree what's true of our culture is the tyranny of stuff. Uh, One NBC article said one in four Americans have a clutter problem. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and see where you're at in that uh, research there. But uh, the average home, get this, has over 300,000 things 84% of Americans uh, say that their homes are not organized enough. We can all agree that things demand our attention, right? We have to store them, clean them, maintain, fix them. They gather dust. Eventually, we throw them out or even sell them. And you see, the primary problem is not what we do to our stuff. I think the primary problem is what our possessions do to us. One psychologist and researcher, professor on this uh, medium.com site, she has this article, very interesting titled, The Psychology of Possessions, What Things Mean to Us and the, the Power of Objects. And sociologists, they're researching this field that how, how things have this power to shape and form us, uh, the relationships we're in, the attitudes and behaviors that we take. Another article from the British Psychology Society, entitled uh, Psychology of Stuff and Things, uh, this sentence caught my attention. As our belongings accumulate, becoming more infused with our identities, so their preciousness increases. So we value stuff because it's saying it becomes who we are. Now, you're thinking, why, Jason, share all this? I'm sharing this because I want you to see what modern sociology and psychology is discovering. It's just affirming what the Bible established long ago about the human condition, is that possession and money have this deceptive power to shape us. And the world wants to tell us that it's through money and wealth and things and possessions, it will open up all the doors to success and happiness and comfort and freedom and identity and meaning and purpose. But today we discover that Jesus informs us there's one door that money and possessions will not open. It's the doorway to the kingdom of God. Last week, we've seen the radical demands of Jesus, how that affects marriage. In a similar way, we're looking at how money and possessions become barriers in following the radical demands of Jesus. We're looking at the barriers, how it prevents and hinders and distracts us in our devotion to Jesus. You have an outline in front of you. We've got one barrier and then a second barrier with this encounter with this man. And then there's going to be Jesus correcting that and giving some assurance as well. So let's jump in. First, we have this famous encounter with this unnamed character. He's known as the rich young ruler, and we discover the first barrier to the kingdom. It's moral goodness. Mark tells us as he was setting out on a journey, uh, remember, we're in the second half, and on the journey is this language in the second part, the final journey to Jerusalem, on the way. And these teachings on the way, it's about accepting the mission of Jesus. If you accept, get ready for the high demands, this high cost of following him. A man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inher- inherit eternal life? Now, last week, the Pharisees, we saw, they did not have sincere questions. Now, the opposite, we see a man with a sincere question. Question, And he is on this spiritual quest. Now, good teacher, perhaps that was a bit of flattery to Jesus, but likely it's just this greeting of respect, kneeling down, falling at his feet, and he pops the genuine question here about eternal life. Now, let me pause. John's gospel deals a lot with the question of eternal life. Mark's gospel, 
not so much. It's really only here we see this theme of inheriting eternal life. Now, most Jews at the time, they had no doubts about what God required of them. It was obedience to the law of Moses. And here we have this man, he's affirming there is life after death, but he's concerned now about doing the right things in this life before death. Now, maybe he's going to Jesus to kind of re, uh, relieve some of his lingering doubts. You know, let me know, Jesus, if there's you know, anything in the fine print that I've missed. You know, give me a heads up. Is there something I'm missing? And essentially, his logic here is, how can I do more now to invest in the next life? So on one hand, that's kind of a, a good pathway. Now, if we pause here and just think about this spiritual quest he is on, I believe it is being played out in the minds and hearts of millions of people, especially in this country. Uh, let me give you some research from uh, Arizona Christian University. This surprising research is that unlike past generations, they discovered that 52% of self-described Christians have accepted a works-oriented view of salvation, this salvation-can-be-earned kind of approach. And additionally, we have about three-quarters of adults in America, regardless of their religion, they believe in some kind of heaven, some kind of eternity. And so the combination of these fa the statistics here is that many people just believe, well, if there is a heaven, I got to work to achieve it, right? I got to ensure that the good outweighs the bad. Now, on one hand, I think if non-Christians are holding to this view, I mean, they're free to believe uh, what they want or what you want. If you're listening and you're not a Christian, I mean, I don't agree with that, but you're free to agree with it. But what's heartbreaking is that this tells us the majority of American Christians believe this. And that tells us that they do not believe and understand the gospel. So we need to hear this exchange with this man. It is extremely relevant for our day and age. And I said before when we started the Gospel of Mark, most people view Jesus as just a good moral teacher, right? Tell me, Jesus, what good I need to do to kind of add to my existing moral goodness, right? How can I just add Jesus to what I'm already doing? But what have we discovered in Mark so far? I said from the beginning, if you want to understand Jesus, you need to understand the kingdom of God. That's his primary teaching. And the way of the kingdom is not something that we add on to our lives. The way of the kingdom completely subverts our lives. It completely subverts it. And so like many today, this man wants the promise of the kingdom, but it turns out he's not ready. And Jesus is going to tell him what he needs to hear, not what he wants to hear. Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one God. Now in Jewish thought, uh, God was preeminently good, the source of all good things. So throughout Jesus' life, he's exalting God by saying these kinds of things. Now this scene's gonna develop and this man gets more than he bargained. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, uh, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. Now, what is Jesus doing? Well, he's restating the Ten Commandments, which every Jew knew very well. And interestingly here, he kind of leaves out one to four of the Ten Commandments. He gives six to nine, but the tenth one, uh, thou shalt not covet, he kind of changes it to say, do not fraud. Now, there's different views from scholars on what Jesus is doing, but it appears that Jesus is kind of drawing out the implications of coveting. Perhaps it's kind of like a subtle jab to this man about maybe the financial activities that he was involved in where there's this economic exploitation, which is the result of coveting. But regardless, the man's puzzled, and he persists in his claims of righteousness. I have kept all these from my youth. Perhaps maybe he's a little defensive in his reaction, or maybe he's just triumphant. Jesus, I've been good. You cannot doubt my sincerity. And from a human perspective, we see this man, he kind of appears like the ideal candidate. Now, when we pause again and consider what have we learned about the kingdom of God, 
In Mark's gospel, we've learned badness won't let you into the kingdom. Remember Mark chapter one, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news, right? Admitting your sin, confessing that you are in rebellion to God. So unrighteousness disqualifies you from entering the kingdom of God. But now we discover kind of the opposite problem. Moral goodness won't let you in either. (laughs) Good obedience, in fact, won't cut it. It disqualifies you. And so we see the first barrier here is this dependence on moral goodness. Now, Jesus is going to expose another barrier getting at the root of the problem here. It's this problem of depending on possessions, things, wealth. I'm putting all those together. Then looking at him, Jesus loved him. I just love Mark's eye for detail. He's giving us purposefully this glimpse into the heart of Jesus. The only time in Mark where it specifically says Jesus loved an individual. And Jesus doesn't sneer or scoff at this man, this kind of self-proclaimed law keeper. He doesn't ridicule kind of this man boasting in good works. But because of his love for him, he speaks the truth to him. And he said, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now this one sentence, it is just jam-packed full. Uh, Let's dissect it first. uh, The man lacks one thing. What is it? That Jesus doesn't say. (laughs) Yet he tells him to do something. Sell all you have and give to the poor. Now, why does he tell him this? I was pondering it, and it kind of feels like Jesus is kind of leading him on this journey of self-discovery. He's kind of like, you know, Mr. Doer, you want to do something? Do this. Get rid of everything, right? If eternal life is a concern to you and you want it, sell all now and you'll have that investment in the next life. And guess what? overjoyed and thrilled at Jesus' words. He's learned the truth about entering the kingdom of God. He is just eager and delighted and gives it all away. Not really. (laughs) Far from it, in fact. But he was stunned at this demand and went away grieving. Literally, that means his face was gloomy and sullen. It showed the disappointment. I mean, it was visibly obvious here, this look on his face. Why? He tells us because he had many possessions. You see, Jesus has exposed the core of his identity. He expected this kind of Jesus to kind of add to his already good works, adding Jesus to his current zeal to do more. But in fact, the one thing he couldn't do was part with what he valued most. That was a dependence, a reliance on possessions and wealth. And we look at this man and we're thinking, man, he is just so close. Came to the, came to the, at the right time. I mean, he's young. Came to the right person, ran and knelt to Jesus, asked the right question, wanted eternal life. He received the right answer, follow me. But we see he had the wrong response and he turned away. Now, Make sure you understand what's happening here. Jesus is not saying that the problem is that he had possessions and wealth. The problem is that the possessions possessed him. And he was fooled into this deceptive power of the possessions, right? That we've looked at, how they form and shape our identity, our purpose, our meaning, and our security. And at this time in Judaism, wealth and prosperity, many believed it was a sign of God's blessing. And so he's probably thinking, I mean, why give up what God has blessed? But Jesus comes along with his kingdom view, and he just undercuts this man's spirituality. He just undercuts his current view of what it means to be blessed by God. And we see with this penetrating spiritual insight, he just exposes what hinders this man and why he can't follow Jesus. And what was Jesus' method to this individual? He says, sell all. That was Jesus' method for him to reveal his false beliefs and idolatry and what, in fact, was ruling over him. So the one thing he lacked, church, was this willingness to depend on the one who gives, this willingness to come under the reign and the, 
the, the reign of God, to come under the kingdom of God that would rule over him. So if we just pause and put all this together, what we're seeing, here's the main idea of this. Disciples must learn not to depend on what we possess, but depend on the one who gives. Sorry, must learn not to depend, I'm sorry. We must learn not to depend on what we possess, but depend on the one who gives. So in this journey of discipleship that we've seen in Mark, it's this all-encompassing denial of self, right? How we enter the kingdom is how we live in the kingdom. We can't depend on things and wealth that give us meaning, purpose, significance, value, identity, because these things shape who we are, and that church is the role of God. That's what happens when we live under the reign of God. His power, the power of God, should shape and influence us. Are you tracking with me this afternoon? Now Jesus is going to expose this conversation. He's going to now use it with the disciples. And he offers a corrective, which is dependence on God. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? But the disciples were astonished at his words. So the, Jesus is just bombshell conversation with this man. It also shocked the disciples as much as the young man. <laughs> that is just remarkable. And again, it went against, went against the current belief in Judaism that wealth and prosperity was evidence of the blessing of God. And so they're thinking, how can that be a barrier to entering the kingdom of God? Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So they were even more astonished, saying to one another, then who can be saved? Now, this is the first time Jesus calls them children, and that is significant, I believe, remember, The last scene last week when Jesus says, welcome the kingdom like little children, right? We saw that was as powerless as people with no rights, no status. Mark is linking now the disciples to be like this, as the powerless ones who lay down their status and privilege uh, that come from money, possessions, and wealth and enter the kingdom of God empty-handed. And so Jesus now, he reinforces the point. He uses this colorful illustration. The eye of the needle is the smallest kind of thing imaginable, and the camel was the largest animal in Palestine. So what's the point? He's just saying, hey, if you, if, if you trust in possessions, it's easier to thread the needle with a great big camel than get into the kingdom of God, right? In modern day imagery, we'd probably say it's easier to maybe, you know, drive a Suburban through the bank deposit slot at an ATM, <laughs> an impossible scenario. And as normal, Jesus' illustrations, they work beautifully because the shock factor worked. The disciples were astonished. They now have the same question as the rich man. How can we enter and receive these eternal rewards? How can we have favor with God? Now, after Jesus kind of just crushes their hopes around wealth and possessions, Jesus is going to rebuild their hope around what's possible. Looking at them, Jesus said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. Remember, what have we been learning about the kingdom of God in Mark? The kingdom of God is always surprising. It is always different than what people expect. Human nature is you bring what you think is valuable to God. And the kingdom of God way is all of that is useless. You have nothing to add. And that's why Jesus' kingdom teaching is offensive to so many people. You see, the way of the kingdom of God, it is entirely new. What's impossible, we're seeing it's entering the kingdom of God by human effort. The way of the kingdom, it's not about adding, it's about denial, right? And when you understand this, Jesus is saying there is this new doorway that opens. All things are possible with God. God is the gracious and good giver. Now, Peter, the spokesman of the disciples, as uh, normal, he kind of opens his mouth a lot. He obviously 
doesn't understand. He says, Peter began to tell him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Now, Peter says something that's true indeed. They left their boats and their nets, chapter one, and followed Jesus. And I think it might be, perhaps Peter and the guys are a little awed and dazzled over the wealth of this young man. Maybe at this point, they're kind of reconsidering their sacrifices. Lord, you know, we gave it all up, but is it worth it? I mean, (laughs) what we've given up, Lord, what's the payoff? And I think that's true for us. I think we can relate to Peter. We think sometimes, you know, this, this way of denial, following Jesus, I mean, is it really worth it? When will we see the return on an investment, so to speak, this cross-shaped life? And that's why finally we come to the assurance of the kingdom that Jesus needs to give to the disciples and to us. I assure you, or mark my words, Jesus said, there is no one who has left House, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or fields because of me and the gospel. Now, in the ancient world, your relatives, your family, your basic property, I mean, that was the basic, the basics of survival in the ancient world. If you didn't have that, you were cut off from life itself. So it would be like today maybe being in a homeless position. And we see here, Jesus is a realist. Uh, There is no easy believism with Jesus, kind of just say a prayer and Jesus is gonna make your life better. He says there's real costs in following him. And perhaps for some disciples, there will be a loss of this support network that puts your very life at risk. But the good news, verse 30, who will not receive a hundred times more, now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecution and eternal life in the age to come. So he's saying now at this time, that is forsaking family possessions, the source of purpose and significance in life in the here and now, by giving that up, Jesus is saying, you receive a hundredfold gain. Well, what do we gain? He's saying this new and ever-increasing family of disciples. Remember chapter 3, a long time ago, how Jesus redefined family in the kingdom? He said it's not about bloodlines, but it's about those who do the will of God. And we see this little qualifier, with persecutions. With persecution. So it's kind of a mixed bag. The good news, yes, but there's some realistic and hard-hitting news. He makes no promise that the faithful will have protection against suffering. I mean, that is one thing that false, misleading prosperity teachers want us to believe today, that if you have enough faith, and then you're entitled to blessing and prosperity, and there's no suffering. But the fact is, faithful followers, Jesus says, may or will experience suffering. And we see the promise here, this assurance, it's that in the age to come, eternal life, that is the disciples' hope setting our eyes on the world to come. Jesus ends this reassurance with this upside-down way of living we've seen, but many who are first will be last and the last first. God, listen, church, God does not order as man does. Those who appear in this life first in the world, right? Paradoxically, Jesus is saying, one day they will be last. And those in this life who deny themselves and take up this cross-shaped life and let the cross shape our identity and let the cross of Christ have power over us, we will be first in the age to come, amen? As we come to the end, we gotta think, okay, Jason, how do I apply this? What do I do with all this? Maybe you're wondering, Do I go home and like uh, give my house away and kind of donate all my things on Facebook Marketplace? Do I have a garage sale? Is that what this means? And kind of liquidate all my stuff and go live a life of aestheticism and take an oath of poverty and go live in the wilderness or forest? (laughs) Well, we know if it was that easy to enter the kingdom of God and live in the kingdom of God, uh, we would have rid ourselves of all that stuff a long time ago. Remember this about this passage and how we read the Bible. Jesus' instructions, it was to one individual, the only time in the gospel, we see one individual where Jesus gives this command. Nowhere is this command universal 
for all followers to divest themselves of their things and possessions. His command here is an exception rather than the rule. I mean, we see in the Gospels, I mean, people owned houses, right? They went to homes in the Gospel. But here's the thing. What is universal for all disciples of all times and all ages is asking this question. I call it an x-ray question. Do my possessions possess me? The things I'm acquiring, are they maybe subtly acquiring me? For example, if I got, and you fill in the blank, if I got that thing, what would it change in my life? What am I believing that it is going to enable me to feel and do? We have to ask these x-ray questions that penetrate our hearts, right? What hope am I placing in these things? What do I believe it's going to accomplish? We have to realize the deceptively dangerous power that these things can have over us and consume us. For example, just maybe ask yourself on a scale of 0 to 10, how aware are you of the power of the possessions in your life or money or wealth. But the good news is, church, since we are united to Christ, we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, amen? The Spirit to lead and guide and prompt us. Galatians says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so with the help of the Spirit, we can learn what is God-honoring choices Versus God distancing choices. And so we say, Lord, expose to me. Is there anything that I'm buying into where this is giving power in my life to sway over me, my identity? Lord, what's hijacking my heart? Or perhaps someone that knows you well, ask them, hey, what do you see these things doing to me? That's a hard question to ask. The second application is I think we need to just understand the pathway of discipleship, right? And we need to realize that growing as a disciple, it means growing in stewardship over what God has entrusted to give to you, right? So we see this passage, it kind of moves us in the direction here of stewardship because we've seen if possessions and wealth and money can have power and influence over us, Well, then surrendering it to the Lord and asking for the Spirit to guide us, we can allow them to shape us for good, amen? Shaping them for use in the kingdom. You know, often we think, I want to grow spiritually, so I need to pray more and I need to read the Bible more. Those are great things. I'm not saying to do those less. But I think when we deal with our things and we deal with money issues, it can be one of the most spiritual things that we can do because it reflects the degree we believe in what we confess. It actually shows the degree we're believing what we confess. And so I would encourage us, church, for us to develop the discipline of generosity and stewardship as a way to kind of counter and offset that temptation and the power that possessions and money can have over us. And you know what I'm talking about, that pull inward, right? Maybe greed or envy or selfishness or self-protection where we just kind of want more and more for some reason. When we move in the opposite spirit, church, we are beginning to develop this new discipline of generosity and stewardship. It's kind of like in exercise and fitness, right? You develop a muscle and you gain strength by slowly doing a regular and routine habit of exercise. It's the same way. We develop the muscle of stewardship. We build it in the same way. And I think, church, with these very practical issues of money, it has a profound capacity to bring spiritual freedom. And so the one way, church, that we can embrace this lifestyle of discipleship, I think first we need to say, are we tithing regularly? Are we giving regularly? That practice is how we live out We are not to depend on what we possess, but depend on the one who gives. And let me take it a step further. Beyond regularly giving and tithing, I think we need to work, church, to always aim to broaden our understanding 
of this stewardship, this lifestyle of stewardship, this God-centered, kingdom-oriented view, right? And that is not natural for us. That's why I would encourage us, check out some of the Right Now Media resources. There's great studies on there about uh, budgeting, possessions, wealth, management, things that deal with this topic, perhaps in your own devotional life or maybe with a small group. But learn to ask as a community, these questions on this topic. But the fact is, church, as we come to the end here, no matter what we own or what we don't own or what we make or what we don't make or what we have or what we don't have, there is a real and present danger for us, for disciples of Jesus, that we can become dependent on money and possessions and we can slowly buy into the lie of what these things promise us. And so I encourage us, let's find these things that we need, security, significance, meaning, purpose, joy, and meaning, that we find it by being dependent on the one who gives. Amen? As we follow him, Jesus, and we continue on this cross-shaped journey, we will find all we need and are looking for in him. Let's pray together as the worship team comes up. Lord, another week of a hard-hitting passage that strikes at the core of who we are. We've seen in recent weeks position, last week marriage, and today possessions and wealth and things and money, very practical areas of life. Lord, I pray for this church that we would become a community of brothers and sisters that grow in this discipline and keep each other accountable, and learn to love one another by helping and teaching and, and growing and helping others mature in this discipline, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of generosity and stewardship that I see in this church. But as Paul says in Philippians, may your love abound more and more. Lord, we want to keep growing. We want to keep pressing into the things of God in this area, Lord. Take a minute, church, before we respond in this song just to confess if there's something in your life to the Lord in this area. Maybe there has been a self-reliance in the last seven days. I want to give you a chance to just confess it right there in your seat to the Lord. Take a minute. Lord, we thank you as we took communion that we, we realize and know the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sin. We thank you, Lord, that today, tomorrow is a new week, Lord, to walk into the things of God, into the promises that you have for us as your people here. Help us to grow in this area, Lord. Thank you.
Lord, you can have my heart. God, I pray that you will continue to show me the parts that I have not given to you, the parts that still need healing, the parts that still need growth. God, I pray that you search me and that you show me and that you change me and you grow me more and more into your likeness, Lord. And I'm so thankful that you have forgiven me for the past and for all that I will need forgiveness in the future. And God, I'm so thankful that you choose to use us, broken people, to bring glory to your name, God. So whatever it is, God, keep working in us. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, would you stand and let's give a clap of praise to the Lord for Communion Sunday, all that we have in Christ. Receive the benediction, maybe with your hands out. I think it's a fitting posture to receive from Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth through a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that will never fade, spoil, or perish that is kept in heaven, GC2, for you. Lord, as we go out of these doors, let us not forget the promise of eternity in the age to come. And would that hope and promise change how we live today and how we Use the things that you've given us. Help us to be stewards that reflect your goodness to a world in need. As we go out of these doors, Lord, help us to be salt and light to people who are in need of hope. And the people of God said, amen. Have a great Sunday evening. We've got decaf coffee and teas and some snacks out there. Hope you can stick around and fellowship. I'm up here if you'd like prayer. Love to pray with you, whatever's going on in your life. See you next Sunday. Amen.